and you're live. Welcome back to part three of the Vermont House Human Services Committee on Wednesday, February 9th. And first on our agenda is to talk about, um, I believe there is a, um, an amendment to uh, H628 that was discussed yesterday, the day before it was discussed <laughs> um, earlier. And uh, I imagine, um, uh, Tucker, will you be walking us through the amendment? There he is. Um, and I believe the amendment is on um, our committee webpage. And if everyone can just pull it up on their computer so that we can see Tucker while, uh, um, while you go through and report that. What's it listed under? It would be draft 1.1. .1. You may just have to refresh the page. It's this one. I would hit right up here. Oh, there we go. So then if you scroll down, it should be under Tucker there. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Straight off. So, <laughs> so, we're, so we're refreshing. Mm -hmm. We're refreshing our documents. And for anyone who is um, okay and uh, it's very exciting for us. We have two visitors, and so I just want to, we're not used to having visitors, so I want to um, uh, sort of review the fact that visitors are observers, and um, uh, thank you. Okay, Tucker, we're ready for you, finally. <laughs> you caught me just as I was swallowing a bit of water. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. You should have in front of you draft 1.1 of the committee's strike all for H628. Uh, although there's quite a bit of text here, there are really only three changes from the bill as introduced. And I used my handy dandy and convenient digital highlighter to highlight those changes for you. Uh, we will begin on page three and that is section two in subsection A on line 16. Uh, the first requested change was to make a should a shall so that the second sentence in subsection A now reads that the state shall adopt a simple process by which an individual may amend the marker on a birth certificate to reflect the individual's gender identity. The second instance of amendment here is the clause that immediately follows, which states that uh, the ability to amend a marker on a birth certificate to reflect the individual's gender identity will include a third non-binary marker. To make this clear, that is not a limitation on the uh, authority of the department that follows to add uh, pronouns to the list of gender markers, but it does require that when the department goes through rulemaking, that at minimum, uh, a third non-binary marker will be included. The final instance of amendment is a new subsection D, which you can find on page four, starting on line seven. And this subsection uh, brings a Public Records Act exemption to the records that are created through the process here. Subsection D states that except as otherwise required by law, records relating to the amendment of a birth certificate pursuant to this chapter shall be confidential and shall be exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. There is an existing exemption in this current statute uh, covering many of these records. And I'll give you some details within the subsection D that will help you understand the confines of this Public Records Act exemption. Uh, first, the words in the opening salvo there in subsection D, records relating to the amendment of a birth certificate. Uh, this would cover not only the records that would have historically been exempt from copying under the Public Records Act, which would include, for example, uh, 
the execution that's issued by the court related to the amendment of a birth certificate, but it would also now cover the request that is submitted to the Department of Health and any other records that are created or acquired in the process of requesting a change to a birth certificate. Uh, in case your committee is not overly familiar with some of the very discrete components of Public Records Act exemptions, the phrase shall be confidential is mandatory, which means that uh, the public agencies that hold these records would not have the discretion to release any of these records. They would be mandated to keep them confidential from public inspection and copying. Those are the changes within the strike all amendment. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. We have a, um, a bunch of questions. We will start with Representative Wood, then we'll go with uh, Representative Rosenquist and Representative Brownstead. Um, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, I just want to confirm these all look uh, like the same uh, recommendations that we received from the health department. Um, when we discussed when we last discussed this bill so just uh, confirming that this is really just putting them into the statutory language within the bill is that correct all of the initial recommendations that were contained in the bill as introduced are brought in here with the three highlighted changes that i discussed and yes this would be incorporated into title 18. and we will be hearing from um, the Department of Health and David Englander. Yes, yeah. I just was wanting to, uh, uh, we have discussed these three things previously. I was just wanting to make sure they were the same th three things. They appeared to be, but didn't know if you snuck any little thing in there or not. It didn't look like you did, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Representative Rosenquist. Thank you. I, I was just curious, like uh, on this confidentiality issue, uh, if I went to public records and said I wanted to change the, uh, uh, I had adopted a child, so I wanted to change the child's birth certificate to reflect that I were their parents, even though not biologically, uh, would, would that record be confidential by virtue of what you just said, or is, is that exempt from confidentiality and what defines what is confidential and what is not? Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, so your specific question, the Adoption Act actually has very specific requirements for confidentiality that are contained in Title 15A, Chapter 6, I believe, um, or Article 6, sorry. 15A uses articles. Um, and uh, the confidentiality provisions within those statutes would still apply. This is not going to affect those. Uh, if you Take a look at the language in subsection D. It states that the records relating to the amendment of a birth certificate pursuant to this chapter. And what is interesting about this chapter is that it is only this section. So really, we're just talking in this instance about uh, amending a birth certificate to uh, reflect a change in gender identity. Those are the records that would be exempt. Okay, that was oh, my question. Oh, do you have a follow-up? Well, this is a separate question. Okay, so thank you. Okay, we'll come back to you. Okay. And my question actually was around the wording of the records related to the amendment. I just wondered if that meant that birth certificates in general would be confidential now, but what you, I think what you're saying is that birth certificates that have been amended in this way would be confidential. Is that right? Right. The records that relate to the actual amendment process of the record, such as older records that might conflict with the current birth certificate or the request itself. So remember that records under the Public Records Act means anything that's recorded on any surface, digital or otherwise. Um, so that would include, for example, a email communication to the department to initiate the process would be confidential, but the actual final uh, record would be a public record that's available. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, 
Representative McFawn. Yeah, I just had to get up and get my dog out of here, one of my dogs. Um, in section D, um, except as otherwise required by law, what is required by law? That is an excellent question that uh, may be better answered by uh, David Englander. Um, there are requirements that birth certificates um, under certain circumstances and official copies of birth certificates even are shared between state agencies for specific purposes in law. And maybe you can get more detail on what those purposes might be and whether uh, that would be inclusive of information about an amendment to a birth certificate. So Representative McFawn, if you would keep your question and uh, Mr. Englander, if you could keep the answer to that when we finish questioning, Tucker will get to you. Thank you. Um, because we have, um, Topper, uh, Representative McFawn, your hand is still up. Is that a legacy? No. Okay. Um, Representative Rosenquist. Thank you. Just wanted to verify if I heard it correctly. So the markers relative to uh, sex, okay, or gender. Uh, there are three of those that are now acceptable on the certificate. Is that is that already in place, or is, is that what this thing accomplishes? And two, to that same question would be, it talks about other pronouns could be added at a later time. At the present time, I don't know that any pronouns are associated with with the current birth certificate and gender. So why would we be adding different pronouns that, um, in the future? Two questions, thanks. The, your first question sounds like a legal question, which I'll answer. The second question sounds more of a policy issue that I probably should not wade into. I definitely should not wade into. So for the first part, uh, think of the construction here as floor and ceiling. The floor minimum requirement that this is going to stand on, uh, the department will have to have three. The third non-binary marker is mandated here. Part of this process, they're going to have to use that third marker. The ceiling, the maximum potential amount of other markers that might be used will be determined by rule. And as you correctly stated, that delegated authority reads that the department may it's discretionary, adopt rules to add gender pronouns to the list of markers on a birth certificate. So mandatory requirement, the department shall incorporate the third non-binary marker. Sealing discretion uh, is that the department may adopt additional gender pronouns. Thank you. Uh, could I have one more clarifying? Absolutely. Okay. And that is on, uh, in our discussion earlier, it seemed like the main reason for the self attestation or a, a, a gender change was because, I should say this, so the non binary marker uh, was one that people self attested to. And it felt like it was discriminatory if somebody wanting a, a, a sex change operation would have to do anything other than do self attestation. I got to make myself clear there or not. Okay. That's what I understood that the reason that we're allowing self attestation was because that's essentially what happens with somebody. Uh, says they're non-binary or non-binary, I should say, they're non-binary. But to say that, if that's self attestation because there's no other proof required. But when it came to a, a gender change operation, uh, there are states I know that require that you bring, bring in documentation that shows the operation has actually happened. But my understanding is this bill says that it's not required. And the underlying reason is it would sound discriminatory that a 
non-binary person would just be able to say they are non-binary, but somebody that wanted to change their gender uh, would have to prove it would. In other states would have to prove it. In this case, we're saying they don't have to prove it. They are gonna self-attest to it also. Is that correct? There are two components that I could respond to within your question. Uh, so for the first self attestation is listed as one of the methods that the department may adopt uh, as a simple process for the individual to request a change. Second component of what you were getting at, I think actually came from the department's testimony about how this issue came up, which was a potential inequity between self-attestation for the purposes of using a non-binary marker versus the current statutory requirements for a change, for example, from male to female, female to male, that would require a court-involved process along with documentation um, and attestation. And uh, if you need clarification on that, I would suggest hearing the history from the department instead of my potentially fumbled uh, explanation of how this came to be. You know, I have a great memory because it was during David's testimony and this came up and I, <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. I think you've answered it. Unless David wanted to explain it a little bit further, but that's fine. Thank you. And do we have um, at this point additional questions for legislative council? Okay, um, I would um, appreciate um, <clears throat> if the health department senior policy analyst, <laughs> 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 um, if, uh, if David will, <laughs> <laughs> I'll get your title right sometime. Good afternoon. My name is David Englander. I'm the senior policy, policy and legal advisor to the Commissioner of Health. <laughs> for you, for the record. Also, for the record, I've never heard Tucker Anderson stumble once. So, um, yes. Madam Chair, where would where would you like me to? What would you like to hear from the department? Um, well, I, um, Representative McFawn had a question, and um, that. Uh, Legislative Council thought would be better addressed by you. Um, and then uh, Representative Wood had a question, which wasn't quite, her question was, are these the three things that we talked about before? And my question drawing from that um, will be uh, the Department of Health, I understood, um, had no problem or supported the bill as introduced. And so um, with these amendments, is that position the same? So to answer Representative McFawn's question, we were primarily thinking of uh, a, a court order that these aren't, that these are that, that, if, that if, a, if, a, if the department received a court order, we would have to produce the documents, but that they would not be available to members of the public under an excellent level documents request. And my question goes further now. Uh, could the um, adopted parents get access to the uh, birth certificate? Um, it would depend on the circumstances for a, for a minor child for a minor child. Um, an adopted I child is an adopted child, whether they're a minor or the, the 20, 21. So I think, so I, the, the answer would be, let's see, if a child had, if a child had changed their gender and the, and the birth certificate, and there's a new birth certificate, if the, if the, if the, if the adopt, if the adoptive parents, am I using that term correctly? Adopt, the adopting parents request yeah. that their birth certificate, they would get the birth certificate that reflected the gender that reflected the gender change. So they would get the birth certificate that's in place after the the agenda, uh, gender change. 
correct. The, the, ch the child, I mean, I haven't thought too much about this to be frank. Um, I, the, the child could, the, 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 the individual could get access to their earlier document, but I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking through this. I don't, I think that if, a, if, if an adopting parent was seeking the birth certificate, it would be the birth certificate of record and that would reflect the gender change. Representative McFawn, you, you still, um, you have a crinkly forehead. All right, well, what about, what about the, the mother and father um, <clears throat> biological mother and father? Or either one of them, could they get the birth certificate if they wanted? They, um, well, Can they, they do it today? Can they do it now? I, can they do? Can they do what? Can, if, can, if, if can my if if my biological mother and father wanted to get my birth certificate, can they get it today? They they could they they could get your birth certificate today. If they were, uh, they would be able to get a certified birth certificate if they were your if they were your biological mother and father, so long as their parental rights had not been terminated. Okay. So my parental rights aren't terminated. I can get the birth certificate. The, the mother and father can get the birth certificate. Reflect, re reflecting, the, reflecting the gender. I mean, we're talking about after somebody has changed their gender, is that right? Yes. They would, they, they would still get the, the current birth certificate which would reflect the gender change. Okay, today, could the adopting mother and father get it? I, I, I think Tucker may disagree. I, I think that any person seeking a, a pre-gender change on a birth certificate other than the individual would not would only receive the document that was later in time. Okay, and let me let me just play this thing out why why I'm asking uh, uh, this question. Representative McFawn, it looks like Legislative Council was going to say something. Why, uh, Legislative Council, if you don't mind, why don't you keep your um, um, not be on mute so that we can have a conversation because it's sounding like um, the three of you and we'll be listening need to have a conversation. <laughs> uh, so David is is mostly right here, and <laughs> Representative McLean, I will say that. The public records law and the intersection with vital records, and very particularly because you've brought it up, adoption records, is endlessly complicated and getting through it requires a Game of Thrones level of malevolent patience. So uh, any, any person can request a copy of a birth certificate. They can get an unofficial copy. Uh, after a change has been made under current law um, to the markers on that certificate, the new certificate replaces it for all official purposes. So whether you're requesting an unofficial copy or an official copy, you're getting the, um, the amended new version of the certificate. You're not getting any of the old versions. Where that gets a bit more complicated is that this system is somewhat new and there are quite a few original records that are likely still kept in places, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, such as the town clerk's offices throughout the state. And for a brief moment in time, as the vital record system was being updated in statute, there was a requirement that after an amendment was made, the original birth certificate would be destroyed by the town clerk if they had an original version in their possession that was in conflict with the state system. But that was removed a few years ago because there was an extreme level of discomfort at the local level and the state level with having uh, official documents, even if they've been replaced, being destroyed by the state registrations agents, the town clerks. Um, another really complicated aspect of this is the adoption registry and what information is available from original birth certificates under the Adoption Act. 
because much of that information is confidential to begin with. So for example, information about the birth parents is rarely, if ever, released, um, sometimes even to the adopted child in the future. So you uh, are navigating with your questions a very complicated road. The easiest answer is to say that in most circumstances, and I'll go as far as to say 98 to 99% of the time, if a request for a birth certificate is made, it will be the newest version of that birth certificate that is released to the requester. Thank you. That answers my question. It, 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 now I'm going to tell you why I asked that question. One of the reasons is there's a life that took place before that birth certificate was changed. There's a lot of things that happened in that life, like maybe somebody had a will drawn up and the name is changed on the birth certificate and um, the sex. How, I, I was just wondering how the individual then could claim that inheritance. That's one thing. There's police records, there's all kinds of stuff. I thought that I was okay on this, um, but now I um, wonder. So. Uh, to, uh, Representative McFawn, I'm not sure, but was there a question in there? No, I'm just, I just explained why I asked that question, because I thought I was pretty clear on that, that um, if, if, if say I left an inheritance to Bobby Jones, but now all of a sudden uh, we have a, an individual named Mary Jones. Okay, so how, so. Oh, that took place in the life before Mary Jones was created on that birth certificate. One, one thing that I would I write. One thing that I would note for you, Representative McFawn, is that these particular records relating to the amendment of a birth certificate and the issuance of a new certificate are already confidential currently under law. They can be released to the individual who requested the changes, who petitioned the court. That person can get their own records, or I think even in some cases get a confirmation uh, from the state registrar about any changes. Let me just confirm that. Yes, may authorize the state registrar to confirm uh, the issuance of a new birth certificate. Um, so the, there's no regime change here in the confidentiality of the records. Okay. So as things are currently operating, they will continue to operate with respect to the confidentiality of uh, amended birth certificates. Um, Representative Small. Yes. Um, one thing I will just add is that uh, the bill before us today is, is really only focusing on the gender marker changes. So name changes um, on birth certificates will, will not be changing the process there. And I I think I can speak for the trans and non-binary community in recognizing that when a name change happens, there is a lot of processes that go into place where you have to change your name on credit cards, through social security, through birth certificates, through wills, et cetera. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated process overall. And I think the hope with this bill is to make one piece of that process easier. Um. Uh, Legislative Council, yes. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention, Representative McFawn, from some of your examples, many of the things that you brought up could be acquired and likely will be acquired through a court process. So you brought up, for example, uh, last wills and testaments uh, and trusts, uh, the probate court could request any documentation or records that have been preserved, for example, by the state registrar related to an amendment. If they had questions about the identity of someone in an older will, comparing it to identity documents that exist at a later period in time. And uh, as David so eloquently covered. So well, that would uh, happen only if you went through probate court, correct? Correct. And 
you would likely go to probate court if uh, there was any question as to your qualification to receive uh, something through the will. Okay. So that person's protected then. Um, Representative Rosenquist, were you, did you have your hand and then? I did, but I, I'll defer to James first. Okay. Uh, well, I just want to clarify for, I believe what was being said to, to clarify for Representative McPond if, if this is the case. If somebody in, in the example of you know name change, identity change, whatever you would whatever you say, the person who did so still has access to the records. So they're gonna be able to prove, hey, listen, this is me. It's not like they're cut out of the process and, and not being able to say, uh, you, you know, they're like, well, this isn't Johnny, uh, it's Mary, whatever. Um, and they have they have that document. They have access to it. It's not like they're they're not cut off from it. So the evidence is still there. To the point. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, James. I appreciate that. Um, there, things happen in life, and um, a person could be incapacitated, and maybe can't for the moment. I know a friend of mine that can't speak right now can't write, but has an inheritance. So he, he can't, uh, someone's gonna help him get it, but you know, it, it's, and, and then and I ask myself, to somebody that's helping him, can they get these records? I, I just don't want somebody to get in a position where um, they can't get what's due to them. You know, grandparents take out life insurance policies in somebody's name. Uh, Taylor just talked about we're not changing the name here. But a lot of times when a birth certificate is changed, the name is changed too. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm less worried about it now. I'm, because we're not talking I'm about it. was all set, but uh, I'm less worried about not being out. Okay, it looks, it sounds like I mean, I, no, I was just going to say, I'm not, I, I'm struggling as to, to why this is an issue when this bill doesn't cover that. That's, yeah, because this bill does not cover name change. But I think the crux that Representative Greg Barr highlighted is that yeah. access from the individual is right. always granted. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, Representative McFawn. No, sorry. Representative Rosenquist. <laughs> <laughs> In, in the news these days, there's a lot of talk about people, um, one gender, they want to play sports um, with a different gender because of the changes in body strength or whatever. Okay, so my question would be that, let's say I'm a pretty good basketball player, but I'd rather become a better basketball player playing in a female league. And can I go and change my, my self attestation just get my name, I'm not named, my, my sex changed through the process that we've outlined here, having no thought that I would ever want to really do a gender change, but that I just wanted to play basketball on a, on a female team. So what, what would prevent me from doing that given this law? Because of the self attestation, okay, or whatever. I am not immediately aware of a Vermont law that regulates um, uh, gender based participation in particular sports. Um, I can only offer from my personal experience as a runner who runs in a lot of competitions that. Uh, Self-attestation is the basis, at least for United States Track and Field Association meets and for any of the long distance races that I've ever participated in. You're saying self-attestation is, is what's required. You wouldn't have to show a birth certificate or anything like that. Okay. I'm saying that I'm not aware of a law that, that governs participation in sports based on gender, but 
that's not my area of expertise. So I may be woefully uneducated on the matter. David, shed any light on that? I, I shared uh, in, in Tucker's observation. I'm sorry. I, I share Tucker's observation. I'm, I'm unaware of anything. Okay. Represent, Representative Small. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, oh, sorry. You no, know, I mean, that was my question. Oh, okay. Pretty much a hypothetical question, but I just was curious. Mm -hmm. uh, as you probably gathered, the self adaptation has been one of my hang ups. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. but, and uh, that was just sort of my final question on that mm -hmm. aspect. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think um, what comes up most for me in this policy is that it, it is specifically impacting trans and, and non-binary people. And I think uh, to your example, it would be rather extreme for someone to go through the process of amending their birth certificate solely to participate in a, a sport um, in a gender that they are actually not aligned with. I um, We've heard this rhetoric come up across the nation, but I don't there's no specific examples that have come up except for preventing um, trans youth from playing sports with uh, the gender that they identify and, and understand themselves as. So there is a prohibition on that? There is not a prohibition. Oh, okay. um, there is just a lot of national discourse about uh, preventing trans youth from participating in sports that identify or that align with their gender identity. Um, but there's this, the rhetoric comes up of what if uh, a guy wants to participate in, in women's sports and they go through this process. And I would say, I have not heard of any examples like that. Um, and often it, it, I would even argue it doesn't exist now. And it would be a rather extreme example if it were to come up. Well, we have this example of this, I think at the University of Pennsylvania swimmer who is breaking all the swimming records, who is uh, a prior male that now identifies as a female, so swims with the female team. So, and whether they had the transitional surgery or whatever, I don't know. But, but my point was that if it's just self attestation what prevents somebody from doing it? understand what I'm saying? I do, I do. And I would say we're even seeing it in the Olympics right now where someone who was assigned female at birth has known themselves to be a woman and also was disqualified because her testosterone levels were higher than um, what we identify for someone who's assigned female at birth. So they accused her of doping, when in all actuality, she just naturally produces higher testosterone levels because our bodies are just as diverse as we are. Um, so I don't think there is a, a specific biological lever that we can say, at this point, you can participate in this sport or vice versa. Um, and I would say that the, the birth certificate in particular would not prevent or offer that opportunity for someone to participate in the sport. I think that um, falls into the agency of education if we're talking about youth sports um, and falls into the other arenas for various other sporting events as I think uh, legislative council has highlighted um, in their own participation in sports. Thank you. Of course. Just to add. I was just gonna say that we don't, we, we're careful in this building not to make legislation that has maybe just one or two odd, odd things that could happen. It's really about the majority, the, the work, the important work that this. Well, I see the discriminatory aspect of this for transgender people versus people that just declare themselves non-binary. I understand that. And so that would might make me vote for it based on just the discriminatory aspect of it. But I'm still concerned about the, uh, what do you call it now? Uh, self attestation aspect mm -hmm. uh, because of how it possibly could be abused, okay? I, I would say that self attestation is the norm in American life. Um, I, how, how frequently have, have any of us had to actually produce our actual birth certificate? That's a very unusual week. We go through our lives, you know, signing things, whether they be notarized or not, under the pains of penalties of perjury or not. But the actual production of, of documents is, is, is very unusual. I'm sorry, could you just say that last part again, David? I, I'm having a little hard. 
Sure. The, the, actual, the actual requirement that a birth certificate be produced is actually extremely unusual. And by that, I don't mean that in the legal sense. I mean that in the practical sense. It's very unusual that we actually have to produce our birth certificate or the birth certificate of our, our spouse or offspring to actually achieve something. It's, it's just, it's, it's very unusual. The, the, much, much, the much more usual, and I say this in, in, the, in the legal sense, the much more, um, the, the norm is self-attestation. Thank you, Dave. Um, are there other questions right now? No question, but one, one more piece that I will highlight is just um, looking at the work that was done around driver's licenses and how that is the, it essentially would be a, a same similar process to self-attestation for someone to be able to declare their gender on their driver's license. Um, and we would have the same process for birth certificate. And I would say um, driver's licenses, of course, are more often presented um, in work and being pulled over, et cetera, a more common identification that we would use. Um, and we have moved in a way to make that an easier amendment. We moved away from what to make that an easier amendment? Um, we have made it an easier amendment if you want to change your gender marker on a license. We added that X gender marker and then even uh, it's the same process if you want to go to an X gender marker or from M to F or, or F to M on the license as well. It's the same process for any of those changes. Self-attestation. Um, my, my question to the committee is, are we, um, are we ready to make, to, to move forward on this? Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion. I move that we uh, find favorable draft number 1.1 of H628. There's been a motion on the floor to uh, accept or um, vote yes. Oh, first we have to do it two times. We have to it's amend the bill. On, so do we have to vote on the bill right, first? The strike, or the strike all. Oh, we, we're, we're writing on the strike all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. This is why I'm not. Oh, that was my inner Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> that was the so Sandy thing. I know. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. A, a motion's been made by Representative Small. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, oh, so, second by um, Representative McFawn. <laughs> is there any further discussion? And if the clerk, when the clerk is ready, call the roll. Representative McFarland. Uh, before I vote, Madam Chair, I want to thank the witnesses for the, uh, the amount of uh, information that they brought to us. And I'd like to thank um, Taylor for the bringing the bill forward and um, for the information that he's provided the committee as well. My vote is yes. I imagine that Taylor is very um, appreciative of that. She is very appreciative. Please continue to call the roll. Representative McFawn. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Small. Yes. Representative Rosenquist. Yes. Representative Garfano. Yes. Representative Whitman. Yes. Representative Payala. Yes. Representative Gregoire. Yes. Representative Noyes. Yes. Representative Brumstead. Yes. And Representative Pugh. Yes. Oh, 11 0 0. Okay. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Um, uh, we may, we probably will not put this on the calendar for um, notice uh, because we don't, in general, as a process, don't like to split up a bill. Um, so it would um, uh, be on notice, I guess, on Tuesday and um, be ready to vote on it uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. And um, I'm going to wish you good luck. We are five minutes late for another topic.